on the quantum level, and particularly for an excited molecule, which has a wide variety of possible processes open to it in a given situation, rate and probability are profoundly related. Intuitively, we know this from everyday life, and I'll give you an anecdote from my everyday life to explain this. So I am a runner, and my rate of miles run in a given, let's say, year is related to the probability of my running on any given day, right? If I have before me the choice of playing Nintendo Switch or recording a video on photochemistry or going for a run, and each of those has a certain probability, if I increase my probability of running relative to those other possibilities, the rate of my running over the course of the entire year will increase. Rate and probability are profoundly related, right? Increase the probability of an event taking place in a given time frame, you increase the rate of that process. And this is very true for excited states in photochemical reactions. So in this video, we're going to talk about these relations between rate and probability and introduce this general idea of quantum yield, which is a notion that's particular to excited states involving the efficiency of photons being converted, quote unquote, into a particular process. So for g given that we have absorbed a photon, what is the likelihood that a particular event will occur, a particular photochemical reaction or a particular photophysical process like fluorescence, right, emission of a photon? The quantum yield gives us a sense of that. So quantum yield, in a sense, is a probability. It's the likelihood of a particular photochemical or photophysical event occurring given all the things that can happen to an excited state. So we just talked about the analogy of the runner versus the other possibilities and the way that rate and probability are profoundly related in that context. And on the quantum level for molecules, the same holds true rate and probability are profoundly related. Now, how do we get a sense of the probability? Well, this equation you see on the slide is helpful for this, and there's a lot going on in this equation. The intuition is the important thing to understand, though, so let's break down what we're seeing in this equation. The P, by the way, is just the probability of some process taking place. So P here simply stands for probability. And what we're interested in, in general, if we want to talk about a quantum chemical event, a photophysical transition, or in some cases, photochemical reaction, we're talking about a conversion from an initial state represented by a wave function, let's call it psi i, to a final state in which the wave function has changed, right? Psi f is our final wave function. And we're interested in the probability of this event taking place. There's an equation that allows us to calculate this probability if we have knowledge of the nature of the initial quantum state, psi i, and the final quantum state, psi f, and we have knowledge of the mechanism by which this process takes place. And that's built into this p symbol. So to lay it out, the operator P is the mechanism that transforms the initial wave function psi i into a new wave function. And if that new wave function picks up, we can say, character of the final wave function, there's some probability that psi i will become psi f. In the language of quantum mechanics, psi i, when operated on by P, can collapse to psi f with some probability. We talk about psi f character. The initial wave function operated on by p picks up some psi f character, and that gives this transition some probability of taking place. And by taking what's called the inner product of p psi i with psi f, we get the amount or the extent of psi f character that is built into p psi i. Squaring the psi f character in p psi i gives us a measure of the probability of observing a transition from psi i to psi f. And at this point, if you're thinking, how do I calculate psi i? 
How do I calculate psi f? What is p? How do I represent that? Let's pause and take a breath and understand that, first of all, you already know a lot about the quantum states of molecules, and we will talk about a system that allows you to write a simple quantum state of a molecule on the back of a napkin on a bad date using nothing more than your brain. It's a zero order approximation, but one that is very good and allows us to start applying this equation, not by plugging in numbers, but just by thinking intuitively using a very straightforward formalism that's really built on the Lewis model, which you already know. The Lewis structural picture of a molecule gives you a sense of its quantum state, and that works in both directions. And we will talk about drawing Lewis structures of excited states to emphasize that point a little bit later in the course. So as far as the quantum states go, you want to think visually. You want to think in terms of what are the shapes of the orbitals and how are they occupied. And in terms of the operator, we can actually think visually as well. The operator can rotate, scale, modify the orbitals based on the particular effect in play. An operator can, you know, excite a vibration of a certain type, can, can move nuclei in, in that sense. There are physical visual underpinnings to these operators that I encourage you to try to think through as you're trying to infer quantum probabilities. And it's all about this idea, and this is a point that Turo gets at in his book, of quantum intuition. We're not so much interested in applying this equation to calculate numbers. We're more interested in developing the right visual intuition and, you know, heuristics and general kind of notions about how the quantum world works from equations like this. And that comes with time and with practice. Now, the argument we made previously about the deep connection between probability and rate, which applies you know, just as well to people you know, trying to get healthy as it does to molecules, based on that argument, this probability is directly related to the rate of the process associated with this transition. And how we represent the rate, by the way, and, and this is really just a refresher from general chemistry, but it's important to keep in mind, is, is using a unimolecular rate constant. So if we think about the units of a rate constant, they are something like inverse seconds for a unimolecular or first order process. And that tells us how many times this event takes place in, for example, a second. And so this, this rate constant is a measure of the rate for a unimolecular process. And it's a number that is profoundly related to this quantum probability. And we will see a number of rate constants throughout this course. And in fact, we've already seen a few in the video on length, time, and energy scales in photochemistry. There's a little bit more that comes into this relation. Right now, we're just saying, OK, they're related. When we talk about Fermi's golden rule in future discussions, we'll broaden out this relationship a little bit and replace this arrow with an equal sign and some additional terms when we broaden out this idea and discuss Fermi's golden rule in a future lesson.